No, it's probably a whole lot of really small things that have sort of contributed to, to the problem. So identify the issue, contain it, and then replicate it, and then investigate, fix it, and roll the fix out. Um, we use the micro deployments, as we said, so we can put out a few lines of code to change a small part of the system. When you put out small lines of code, you don't need to do too much testing. It can just sort of just roll out and just do this really quickly. So, good example. Um, we measured a problem. We were getting 2.04 seconds per API request, right? It was crap. It's a really bad feeling when you've got customers out there and you know it's two seconds before the API goes, hey, here you go, right? We made a change, actually it was a few changes, and that dropped to 285 milliseconds. And right now it hovers around 200 odd milliseconds for a response. Um, and that we were so happy about. But what we, we went through was measuring the problem, rolling out a change, re-measuring the problem, okay? And just going back, can we do something else? Yes, yes, yes. And what's interesting about this is that the first instinct when you have a problem is you're gonna turn up the dials in Azure. You're gonna go into Azure and you're gonna go, right, go from P0 to P1, or P1 to P2, or you're just gonna turn up the dial to make the problem go away. All you're doing is if you think of a car accident, you're driving towards a brick wall, and you think, right, if I move this another notch in the database, all you're doing is moving the brick wall further away. You're still gonna hit the brick wall because there's fundamentally something wrong. Making the thing more powerful and faster doesn't make the problem go away, it just moves it down the road. So another problem with that is if you change the dials, suddenly you can't relate things back to your measurements. Okay, so you're getting a two second delay if you turn the dials up and then go about fixing it, you've got nothing rel relative to the, the original problem. You've now increased the speed of the thing and your first measurement, you have no idea whether you've made a 5% imp improvement, 50%, 100% improvement, you have no idea. So don't turn up the dials as your first instinct. Okay? And the warning signs on this, they haven't just appeared overnight. Like for us, the scale file was building over about four or five days. So it's not as if you're sort of sitting there and all of a sudden, oh my God, we've got two second um, response times in our API. There would have been a point where it was one second, probably. Um, we had that, we just didn't notice it. So a couple of other things that we had sort of wrong with the way we we're doing things. Our front end team had a micro deploy process. They had it down like, like clockwork, we could deploy something in 20 minutes from code, test, out, to all, out through all the different servers, all the staging, out to live, bang. Um, awesome. Backend engineers didn't really have a system. It was like, do some C-sharp changes, uh, s this guy will test it, it'll go to this team member who will do this, and I, oh, actually, no, wait a minute, that branch is conflicting with that one. Wait, uh, and it was just, it was shocking. We couldn't actually roll out C-sharp changes very quickly at all. Um, so there was a bit of an imbalance there between uh, our team uh, from the front end to back end. I happily say that this has changed now. Um, all of our, our code can be rolled out in exactly the same process in exactly the same way. So this really came out during a scale fail. Because you've got the front end going bang, fix, 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 and then the back end team just running all over the show going ah, blah, blah, blah. Oh, there's another fix on the front end. How are you guys going? Um, not sure where we're up to. Not cool. So that's why I was saying earlier about having the process right and figured out from the start. So, a few things about um, process. Trust your team. So if your team are all, if they love the product, and they've worked hard on the process, they've worked hard to put together what to do uh, when things go wrong, then you just need to trust in that process, trust in the team, and also trust in the graphs. As I said, at some point over that first four or five days, there was a point where our response times were half a second, then one second, before they got to the two second that we noticed. Okay, so just trust in everything to do with that, um, to do with process and team and graph. Right, point number two, love your data. So. When I flash that up on screen, I know exactly what's going on there, okay? That's normal, and that's great. I know that that is a one hour period, 
I know we've fired through 20,000 requests and we're doing about 200 milliseconds of um, response time. So there's no errors, happiness. So it's great to become a, a data geek. If you're a software engineer, data geek is not too much of a big leap to get to. Um, but learning your graphs, learning the numbers, and, and knowing what's normal is super important. The reason why knowing what normal looks like is because when things go bad, you can relate it back to, well, that graph doesn't look like the graph on a normal day. Okay, So you've got to know what good looks like. And what we do is we actually have a, a data point as uh, a team, one of our team members um, gets nominated every morning in our 905. We have a thing at five past nine every morning. So in the 905, someone gets up and says, today I'm going to talk about response times. Cool, okay, go. So then that person will actually go through all the response times and tell us what's normal, what they've seen, what da da da, and just go through and give us a bit of an education on a particular data point. And we've also extended that out to our SEO stats as well now. So every morning we have a little five minute talk about data. And it's pretty cool. Like there are things that, you know, I'm, I think I'm across a whole lot of stuff. But there are things that particularly Anna, who does a lot of our um, SEO data analysis, she stands up and she says something and I was like, oh my God, I had no idea. It's really cool. So incorporating data into your sort of um, conversations and, and talk is, is pretty important and knowing what your normal is, is pretty important. The Goldilocks graph. So I'll show you our dashboard at the end, but we've mucked around with dashboards. I've seen dashboards in other companies. There are ones that have one graph, ones that have 44 graphs projected on 88 projectors all around the room. And there's all sorts of different ways in which you can have your data being projected from your web servers and your, your um, .NET servers and stuff. Project your, your data up live. Make sure everyone can see it. Um, we have two dashboards. We have a um, Google Analytics dashboard and we have our um, Azure dashboard, which we've configured in the way that we like it. And we have a little extension in our browser and it just swaps every 90 seconds. So we just look at the wall. Cool, okay, everything looks normal. We know what normal looks like. But we talk about Goldilocks because our dashboards have changed so much. You know, you start off with a dashboard that has a few things on it, and then you add a whole lot more stuff because, wow, dashboards are cool. And then you go, oh my God, that's too hard to look at. So you back it off. Just find out which stats are important. And don't graph a number, seven, every day, because that's boring. Don't just have a graph that has just a straight line in it. Or, because, <laughs> you're going to get bored and human nature is if you see a, a flat line every day it won't be long before you're not looking at that graph you'll just get bored with it so put interesting dynamic data up make sure it's there don't put it over a week do it for today or maybe do it for a couple of days just make sure the data is dynamic and interesting otherwise you will get bored and you won't look at the graph right so our story <laughs> started with our front-end server going And then we noticed, ah, oh, API server seems to be doing some strange stuff. What tends to happen with these sorts of things is your front-end server gets a whole of requests coming in. Your API f follows pretty quickly in behind that by serving all those requests. And then before you know it, you've got a warning that your DTUs are exceeded and you've got a database problem. But that's likely not happened uh, in just one hour. That's probably been going over time. And again, this is the way it sort of manifested. When we looked back from our scale fail and we looked at, okay, how did this look a week before, uh, we should have seen it, quite honestly. But hey, we learn. So don't wait for those warnings because they're quite scary. You have exceeded 80% of your DTUs. Oh, okay, I'll just have a sleep. I'm not gonna I'll do nothing. No, you need to do something. So our graphs talk to us. We have triggers just firing to Slack. You can use Slack, you can use whatever thing you like. We just use it ourselves. And have triggers that are actually meaningful, something that's gonna make you pop up and look. Something that's not warning you every two seconds, like setting your DTU limit trigger down to 25%, exceeding 25% isn't smart. Because uh, I did that and I uh, got seven a day. And then again, like the human nature thing I was talking about before, I didn't look at them because oh, it's the same old 25% warning, whatever. All right, so set them at, we've set it at 50 and then a real warning at 75. 
so over a five minute period as well. So if, if the database is sitting at 50% for five minutes, I'll get a warning. Well, actually the whole team gets a warning because it goes into Slack. Um, if it goes above 75% for more than five minutes, then we all jump on, get in. So um, thankfully that hasn't happened. And don't hide this. Put it in Slack, everyone can see it because you know I'm here, Gemma's here, we're sitting here uh, not looking at our Slack. Well actually maybe Gemma is. Um, but you know, there are times of the day where you aren't in the office or another team member might be out. So you want to be able to get everyone to see this information. So I think that's a pretty important um, part of it. This is something super dangerous. And again, I'm just showing you, I don't think you can do this in Azure anymore, but this is where you plot two different types of data on the same axes. And we had this. And this is um, the the pink line, I guess it's pink or purple, that is our DTU limit. And the colored blue piece at the bottom, that is the 100% graph of DTUs. So we look at this every day going, wicked, we got heaps of headroom. <laughs> uh, no, that's not true. You can see it's hit 100% because, uh, yeah, anyway. So this was, this was actually a really innocent mistake. We just ticked on two tick boxes in Azure during that flurry when you're learning about graphs and you go, wow, we can turn on everything. Well, here's some unrelated data on a same axis that just fooled us quite badly. So no, we don't do that. Our graph now, our dashboard looks like this. Um, we just have all our servers up the top, just showing the statuses of all the servers in a little cluster. Then we've got our three web servers uh, in the middle there, and um, on the end, you can see the database. We sit the database graph directly under the API server, since they are the ones talking the most. Um, and you can see pretty much that those kind of pretty much relate. Um, so this is what's projected up on our wall, huge, like really big. The whole team sees it, it's there, we know what's normal. If anything changes in these graphs, we see it, and if it gets really bad, we get a Slack notification, so important. Right. Love your product. So if you've got someone on your team who is just working as a software engineer and just can't be asked using your product, move them to another team or get them to do something they really love. Because if they don't love your product, when things go wrong, they still won't love your product. In fact, they'll hate it more. Because they'll say, told you so, told you, nah. So everyone's got to be on board with the product. And I've got a few interesting things that happened to us. So this is something I actually grabbed off Twitter. It was quite interesting. You know, if you have a little small scale area, an error in your code, it's okay. Um, but put it into a loop and suddenly you've got a problem. And this is actually something that we found in our code. You know, just a real small little mistake, which, which is a one-liner, and you go, oh, that's not so bad. But if you put into a for each with 10,000 objects, <laughs> suddenly that small error becomes a really big problem. And that's the problem with, I guess, cloud-based programming is it's not just something that's sitting on someone's desktop. It's sitting out with, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people hitting that same code base. So you're backend engineers. It was only because of our experience. Backend engineers didn't want to use the product. Didn't really know how it worked, wasn't too sure. Wrote some spec, just can't give me a spec. I just want a spec, just work off a spec. Okay, nah, didn't work. Um, only because, you know, we had things that popped up, a 64 kilobyte limit to our workflow definitions inside PageProof. Now that equated to about 100 proofers. Um, back engineers were like, oh no, just thought that was big enough, 65,000 characters. Ah uh, no, <laughs> we needed more than that, so now we've, boosted that right out, which is really great. But we actually had a customer hit that 100 proofer limit. It was probably six months after the, after the piece, but they did hit the limit, and we were like, what is going on? Oh, there's a 64K definition here. Okay, seems silly, but no. Um, we had our dashboard looking across all the tra transient statuses in our dashboard for all our possible proofs. And so that meant that it was evaluating every single proof that a user had ever, ever touched in their entire universe was being looked at in the database uh, and it being evaluated to display on our dashboard. Turns out that actually proofs had end states. You had proofs that were approved and proofs that were closed. We didn't need to look through all those. So that was the main cause of our two second delay. 
we actually cut that and all of a sudden it's 285 milliseconds. Whether you've got 200 proofs or 20,000 proofs, it's always 285 milliseconds. So it's a real simple fix in the end. Um, our backend team had never used a mobile phone to sign out to page proof. They just, did, just didn't want to know. So once we made them do it, they're like, that's crap. Yes, you have to copy and paste the uh, activation code. It's clumsy on a phone. Yes. Can we make that a link now? Sure. You know, it's just because they didn't know what it was like to actually use the product. And another interesting one is uh, one of our front-end engineers had never, ever used a tablet before. He had a Samsung phone that he thought, um, but he'd never, ever, ever used a smartphone before um, and never used a tablet before. So that was one learning that we, uh, and we helped them educate up, so it was good. Um, but that's just something that you find out once you start working on these sorts of projects. So make everybody a user of your product so they understand what it does and they actually run some of their own proofs or whatever is your product does, get them involved. Um, thinking, so this is always hard because scaling thinking is tricky because you know, if I say, um, imagine 100 cars in a car park, you all go, oh yeah. Imagine 10,000 cars in a car park, you go, oh, okay. Imagine 100,000 cars in a car park, suddenly you just go, I don't, I can't, I don't really know what that looks like. So thinking and scale just suddenly becomes a problem with cloud-based stuff because you never just talk about one desktop user or a few users, it's always 10,000s, 100,000s if you're successful in, in your SaaS offering. So we've had some real edge cases that were just totally unexpected. We had one customer who had 588 comments on a, I think it was a 12 page document. What? <laughs> Poor editor who had to go through all those, but uh, you know, that was, a, that was just crazy. And they all had attachments on them as well, so all like suggestions and copy changes and all sorts of stuff for this poor editor, but 588 comments on one document. We had a proof that had uh, over 150 proofers on it, so this document had to be signed off by 150 people. <coughs> Could you imagine doing that? <coughs> but it happens. And we also had customers putting up documents that were over 700 pages long, which is not so bad, but you know, those sorts of things you start realizing that those small errors in code suddenly become big problems when they loop out to these sorts of things. Right, little bit of nitty gritty. Thing that we discovered um, was that we had this idea of a proofing object in our code. So you basically instance add a new object, cool, that would sort of run away in the model and grab all the SQL, do a whole lot of left joins and then fill, fill the object back up. Boom, there we have, yeah, proof. But when you just need to check whether it was open or closed, <laughs> it had to do this massive great SQL join and all this sort of stuff just to come back and say, uh, it's closed. And that takes time. So um, we thought, hey, what about if we have just a little modifier in our, in our um, model that said light? And all that da gave back is like 10 attributes that we check regularly and it's just a simple select star in our database. So all we do now is just go new proof model light and we get back the really light version of that of that object, which is quite nice. Yes, some of you are probably saying, well, just do a SQL call, sure. Um, but we found this is really, really useful. Um, we do the same for our user um, objects as well. It's like, well, we don't need the full history of the user and what they've done and all that sort of thing. We sent up the email addresses, so let's just have a little light version that does that. So that's worked really, really well, and that change alone meant our DTUs went conk down like in one deploy, we just saw the graphs go boof. And we went, okay, that was a good fix. Where else can we go? Um, you know, some of the things that you, <laughs> you sort of expect, that, and a lot of companies do this now, but we were a small team, we didn't do our code review uh, on things that were being rolled out. We would just get to the testers and say, test it. Uh, we found some real doozies once we started code review, like for instance, uh, there was a piece in the JavaScript that you know got back 200 objects and it's looking for a, an ID. It would walk through all 200 of those objects, whether it found the object match at 44, 2, 1, it would go true and then carry on looking through the rest of the, of the array. It's just like, okay, that would have been picked up in code review. But in the early days, we didn't do it because we thought, no, we're just a small team, we need to stay lean, lean on the right things, not everything. Okay, so that's pretty important. And we have 
some pretty basic stuff. We have a, we've written a, um, a bot for GitHub that does a whole lot of stuff for us, changing statuses. When we do pull requests, it does all sorts of magic stuff for us, which is great. We're constantly um, working on that. Lint for saying, well, you know, this is not good code style, etc. So we've got that stopping the ability to merge. Um, and there's a whole lot of other merge restrictions as well in our GitHub account that just means that stuff doesn't just fly out and break. So um, code reviews are really important. A little bit of a code example. This is sort of a bit of fun that we found, and this was in 98 places in our code. Um, what happens here is that we'd get back a set of results. So a user would have 100 proofs in their account. So that would be in the, in the results. So what would happen then is we would just basically add this object proof 98 times. Now I told you before about the left joins and each time we did a new. So now it's doing 98 loops through, running that SQL 98 times to get back a proofs array, a list. Um, when we looked at that, that worked okay for, you know, 10 results, 20 results, but you get back 1,000 results and suddenly you're doing 1,000 hits on that database just to get back a few proofs. What we ended up doing was we just had this one, we just said, oh, looks, we can do this a better way. So now we have just one line, just populates proofs with one SQL query with a um, uh, in and then the, the array of the um, IDs that it matches. That, again, was another conk in our DTUs, like a serious drop. Um, it was really, really, really cool. So this was replaced in 98 places in our code. Um, it, the, the top worked for the first year. We didn't have one question. So for a year, you can go, hey, our code's awesome. It's by sheer brute force that the code is awesome. Um, even brute force can't fix that. So just look out for things like that. Right, so getting towards the tail end of uh, my presentation. Um, after a scale fail, it's all about what we call a group hug, which is like review and go through. So, you know, it is actually a team bonding exercise. This is all about everyone getting together. Um, you really need to understand everyone's roles, what each person's doing, making sure you know um, all the bits you're responsible for. Fixing things, reviewing things, and repeating over. Don't look for the big magic bullet. Um, it might exist. I've given you a couple of examples where we did find a few magic bullets, but it was from a lot of iteration that we actually found that. And if you can, and if you're set up to do it, especially in a SaaS, I mean, if you're in a SaaS business, you should definitely be doing this, and you probably are. Um, you need to get those improvements out, and you need to adopt this whole thing of micro deployments, just tiny, small pieces of code, small changes. We've seen companies that say, well, we can't really do that because testing takes too much time. It's like, well, break your things down into smaller chunks because a small code change rolled out regularly and run it in a high iteration means the testing is actually quite light, okay? You're not having to test the whole thing. Um, when I was talking previously about the back end not having a micro deployment strategy, uh, we would get the um, request to test the entire product as part of the note in the, uh, in, in, the, in the pull request because this changes everything. What everything? <laughs> oh, you must test the whole product because we've made a big change. What specifically? So this is why the micro deploy was super important for us was we were just able to say, what does this affect? Oh, this is just the proof model. Cool, great. And we could focus in on those changes, which was really, really, really important. And lastly there, Move your hand away from the dial. Don't turn up Azure. No muscular people in the room, is there? Maybe a couple. Yep. Um, you eventually want to turn up your Azure thing because that's, that's a good thing because uh, that means you're getting lots of customers on. But don't just turn it up to fix a problem because if you are dialing up your uh, DTUs or going to the next, um, the next virtual machine, all you're doing is racking up big costs, not fixing the fundamental problem, and the problem will come back and bite you bigger next time because you'll have more customers on and you'll have a whole lot more on the, on, the, um, on the hook. So just to recap, embrace your data. Um, make sure that all of, ev all of you are interested in the data and your graphs. Um, make sure your graphs are important and make sure they're interesting because as I said, humans get bored very quickly looking at a straight line. Don't do that. Um, 
if you have a contact with your customers, and a lot of um, development teams now are sort of having someone in amongst the team who's sort of with, um, talking to the customer, or at least the customer reps and things, have that feedback coming back and welcome it because sometimes it can show you well before your graphs do that a customer had something really strange happen. So um, look at those warning signs. And also just put all of that feedback into your Slack or your HipChat or whatever it is that you use. Um, open up some of those channels and get some of those bots and um, um, notifications triggering in there so you can see things coming through. Um, that top one's brilliant. I don't know how else to say it, but code sensibly for scale. That means you need to understand, there's a bit more to that line than it than, uh, than, than makes out. That first means you need to understand what scale means for your organization. For a SaaS company with a global view, uh, scale means 250,000 users, right? It doesn't mean someone on a desktop, it doesn't mean a company of 400 people. It means 250,000 people, potentially all could use it at the same time. They won't, but they could if they wanted to. So when it comes to that, think carefully before writing lines of code and how will this work with 100 people, 200 people, 700 people, 10,000 people on there at once, um, which I can't give you the full talk on because it's tricky. Um, the second line, make sure everyone's a user. Front-end engineers, back engineers, database engineer, infrastructure engineer, get them to play with the product so they understand what it feels like, what it should perform like, what you can do with it, so that when someone says to them, hey, we're having a problem uploading movies in and it's taking 10 minutes to rip, they don't go, huh, is that normal? They know it's normal because they've used it. So, you know, that makes the conversation, the communication between the teams far, far, far better when everybody has used the product and knows what normal is. Expect the unexpected. As I said, you have those edge cases that you know about and we had our edge cases and our first big customer went straight out there, right? And that was a massive learning for us. It's like, what? Nobody does there. Yes, they do. Um, and then lastly, code reviews, super important. Right, so I think I'm literally 10 minutes early, which is good because that means 20 minutes for questions. So hit me with any questions. Yep. Any plans for pushing for this to be um, Yeah, so we haven't yet. Um, we do, we do, um, we do stuff with on our um, testing server with the live, a copy of the live data to actually run things through. So, yes, in a way, but not specific automated testing on. That's something else we're going to look to build out. Yeah. I'd say we're looking at the we're looking at the metrics from the system. Um, we use some other tools we like we fire off events for um, over to intercom and through um, segment for other kind of user events which we keep track of with mix panel yeah, so it's it's just like the all the data is the same Um, so in, in going through all the backend code, we, we saw some quite obvious places and there were some, some more obvious places in there as well, which we were able to identify at the time, but in actually looking at them, we were like, the impact of that is quite low now. So we know that in six months time, at current growth rate, that is going to be a problem. But the refactor was bigger. So we knew, okay, we need to... It doesn't hurt. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that was something really hard to, to, to stop yourself doing because you go, oh, there's a problem. Right, that's going to need a rewrite. Oh, we have to change that, that, and that as well for that to be effective. And it's going to give us a 1% change now. But it went, yeah, so that's, that's one way. Um, the other way is probably looking at the, as you said, the user, the use, like the tracking the user stats. The system stats are great, they show you what the machinery is emitting. 
but it doesn't show you what a human behavior is. So we, um, Gemma spends quite a bit of time looking at the human behavior metrics to say, well, people are now doing a lot of video. Right, okay, what, w how was that six months ago? It was quite a bit lower. Okay, right, and video is heavy, so. Uh, it's a really interesting story, so <laughs> I'll tell you the story, because we've got time. Uh, we went and spoke to a lot of SaaS companies about how they do things, and um, we were under the impression that everybody just popped out changes every millisecond. So we went away and we designed and built the system to pop them out every millisecond, and then we went back and said, this is what we've done, and they all went, wow, we don't do that. And we were like, well, we had the impression you that you did that, and they're like, well, we sort of do it, but we sort of don't. We kind of commit to master, but we don't really like roll it out. So. <laughs> We have this thing which, uh, which we, um, we did by mistake. It was almost an accident that we came across. Um, and it's, you know, it served us really well. Back when we started writing code originally, it was have that board up you know, with the backlog and we had the developers telling us what they felt like doing each day and they didn't feel like doing that. And, and we just went, this isn't going to work. We're not going to hit deadline like this. So we did it a different way. Yeah, we changed early on just to suit us. Um, but yeah, yeah. Nope. We fix forward. So we have a saying in our team, which is we always fix forward. Um, because we can roll out so quickly, if we if we break something, we fix it forward. We don't we don't roll back. That's like, roll back is our absolute last resort. The world's gonna burn right now, we'll roll back, but we haven't done it yet. This is, this is the beauty, well, I guess, and this is something that we've learned is that um, those small changes mean that the, the, the fixes or the, the problem is generally in that area. <laughs> and we have been able, I think we've only fixed forward like what, three or four times in the last 18 months. Um, because the testing is quite specific and very narrow, um, it's not a big process for us to test something. It's, it's pretty narrow. Um, so if there is a problem, it, we just fix forward. That is just our way. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so I would say that um, uh, code review was probably because the areas that were that were the weak points in our in our findings were all pre-code review code, so probably, probably um, some of the uh, if that was code reviewed earlier on um, by other team members that might have probably been picked up. Yeah, um, yeah, we're looking. We're going to look to do, but. Um, I don't know. It's a, it's quite a quite a tricky tricky um, tricky for us to do. Yeah. 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 We would have found, for instance, the proof object one. We would have found that. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to bring that in. Yeah. There's nine of us. Yeah. Yeah. So. Pretty small. Uh, nine, uh, 90, 98 places to change. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, and then you have this other, other place where you say uh, level frustrate and, and you monitor deployment and yeah. everything, right? Yeah. How do you cope with like having that many changes and have your micro deployment testing to cope with it? Like, and, and if you're doing 98 changes and, and 30 seconds, <laughs> how confident are you yeah. that it's going to be? Yeah, so, so what we did with that is um, we took, we, we saw this loop that was filling the objects up, right, okay, and we changed it one place, we rolled it out. And then we tested that, and we tested it in test, we tested it in live to make sure that replacing that loop with this code segment is successful. So you basically segmented it back Correct. more one set and then, then. And then when we saw that was okay, it was basically now we roll that out to 10 places, then we do another 20, then we do another 10. So basically you mitigated the effect of it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So you retested the speed. Retested the speed.
also shared God with the covenant men, but it's the people that have left the faith with them that they consider what we just learned. Yeah. Yeah, sound, yeah, it does sound like we just like roll out this big change. No, we, we did test that in one place, and that was on the dashboard inbox. We knew that was doing it, so we replaced that. It was, uh, we went from like eight lines of code or something down to about four lines of code or something. Uh, rolled that out, went to the dashboard, went to the dashboard, all the accounts we possibly could, test it and test. Then we tested it in our staging, and then we rolled it out, saw it was awesome, and then rolled it out to the other places. Um, how, do, how do we deal with load in our not production? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, yeah, we, we, that's probably an area which we're going to hit next is to, is to probably use something to load, load it up to Azure's like scale. But interestingly, a lot of load for us is around, like for instance, we have these workflows in our proofs. And when you put 150 workflows on, 150 proofs into a workflow, then add it to a proof and then get it to kind of do its calculations that's a load and it's on one object so we can there is that sort of stuff that we do quite regularly but in terms of like putting 40,000 requests against the machine yeah we haven't uh, we haven't got a mechanism back but it's in the plan to sort out yeah, we've still got a lot to do it's uh it's uh i think everybody has though it's uh, it's always a it's always something to do yeah nope Um, that is is in the plan. We're actually going to split the API into two. Um, we're going to split, uh, maybe different, split into more objects, more than that as well, because we have we're using storage a lot, so we're like talking back and forth to storage. So we're going to like break off the API piece that just deals with storage requests and put that over on that machine. So we have all the we're going that way, but it's hard to change kind of when you've got the load of customers experiencing two second delays. We were kind of looking for the small changes and doing lots of them. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know a name for it. Or we, we we kind of Yeah, I don't I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Everyone someone here will be like a methodology like guru and they'll say, You're doing this and I'll go, Yeah, sure. It, it, I'm more concerned about what we do and how we do it than what it's labelled, you know, because it's kind of a, it's a tough one. I, I don't know that everybody does everything the same way. No. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure, yeah. Yeah, so um, we have four internal um, uh, sort of values that we have, which I won't bother you with. But we, w we expose these to the people really early on recruiting. We, sh we talk about, you know, all the things that we believe, what we want to do. We're really upfront with them that, like, we deploy regularly. If you're uncomfortable with that, let us know now, because that's the way we like to run things. Um, and we've had people walk away. Like, had Great candidates just not turn up to the next meeting. It's like, okay, cool, that's good. And I, I want to know that. I want people to tell me no. Um, because we have a very specific um, way we work, um, and it's a, it, is, it is pretty unique to us, um, but it's, it's working for us, and we, we sort of we give, make sure that the new employees understand that right up front. And we're on the North Shore, so we're not competing with a lot of the big companies in the city, so it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there are small there are changes that take a that, okay, so changes that take a long time. Like if we build a big like we did we released video proofing. Video proofing was a, it's a big feature change. So we actually rolled out that code over time. We just sliced out the video feature, 
we rolled that out to live, so it interacts with all the live code, dark code, everyone knows how to do that. And then the last little bit at the end, we tested, boom, hooked it up. Then we use Intercom to basically find out who has been trying to drop video proofs, and we communicated with them first, and then we went out to others. So we used Intercom and its segmentation and stuff to actually message an app. Gemma takes care of it if you want to know more about that. She's sitting right beside you. <laughs> Silence, no hands. That might be the case of no more questions. Now, if you see me around or see Gemma and I around, just come up and talk to us. We're pretty reasonably friendly. So, uh, yeah. So, thanks very much, everyone. Thanks.